So the usual questions I ask at KubeCon at the very beginning. Who's been using Kickloak for, I don't know, more than three years in production? Maybe hands up. All right, that's cool. Um, who is using it for a year in production? All right. Who's been trying it out locally on a desktop? Who's hearing about Kickloak for the very first time today? All right. Right, so um, we will be jumping right into the middle. <laughs> um, still giving some introduction where Kickloak is coming from, but um, maybe you want to look at the uh, Amsterdam presentation for a more in-depth early startup guide on, on Kickloak. Right, so video crew, are we ready yet or not yet yet? We are ready, okay, thumb up, that's good. So welcome, um, welcome to this talk, 10 years of Kickloak. What's next for cloud native authentication in OIDC? Um, together with me is here Takashi Norimatsu from Itachi. Uh, my name is Alexander Schwartz from Red Hat. We are both maintainers on the Kickloak project and guide you through the next 35 minutes. And we will also do a Q&A at the end, which will be part of the 35 minutes. Right, so let's give it a go. Um, Kickloak, well, what is Kickloak? It's an open source identity and access management solution. So basically, it presents a login screen to users. And the initial commit, I would say the birth date of that piece of software, was then uh, in July 2013, and that's almost 10 years ago. So that's why we named this talk 10 Years of Kickloak. Um, Kickloak at the very beginning, well, it was always presenting a login screen to the user, putting in username and password. Um, and what do you need to do that? Uh, you need to have an OpenID Connect protocol implementation on the server, um, because that was new and hot stuff at the time. And you need to have some services, some database, some APIs to store information about your applications, which are then kind of called clients, and identities, which are then called users. Right. And, and from the very beginning, it was from developers for developers. So you could always extend Keycloak. It has APIs. It has um, yeah, service provider interfaces, as we call them. You can do some Java programming and do the things that you need to do in your environment with Keycloak. And that was in there from the very beginning, and we kept that over all the time. Soon after that, we added more functionality. It was multi-factor authentication. Um, client libraries, um, so for, all the, for lots of frameworks during the time there were then implementations of Kiklo clients, libraries, and we added things like SAML, LDAP, all the things that you need in an enterprise context. So that's how it all started and evolved over time. And then it grew. It grew over several years. Um, these are like the Google trends about the keyword Keycloak that are uh, pointing upwards. Uh, the GitHub stars also pointing upwards, so that's probably good. Um, and well, and then it changed over time. Some of the bits changed here and there um, because, well, OpenID Connect is not something that's static. OpenID Connect is evolving, and we will hear about uh, more about that from Takashi. Um, for example, if you're using an earlier version of Keycloak, I think it was around Keycloak version 18 where this changed. When you click on a logout screen, you now like, pass on an ID token because people found out that's more secure when you're logging out, so don't, you don't trick your user into logging out. Um, and that was more standardized then, and we changed the functionality of Keycloak, and when you upgrade from one version to Keycloak to another, you might see this behavior change. Of course, there's a switch you can use to have the old behavior for maybe a backup period. The same is also like back-channel logout, back-channel logout being you're working with lots of applications, they might have been sessions running, and when you log out in the central locations, all these instances of your application will get a call by a back channel, not by the browser, but by a, like a direct connection between the application running on some server and Keycloak being triggered to log out that session. This has also been standardized. Previously, there were like custom implementations in the Keycloak libraries, now it's been standardized, which is great, uh, and standards help. And that's also a trend that we see that lots of frameworks support OIDC, and the more frameworks support OIDC, the more of our own, own implementations, client implementation, we deprecate. Uh, at the moment, they are kind of all deprecated, so we ask you to move to the OIDC client implementations in your projects. 
and we currently maintain only the JavaScript client that we also use in our own UIs. Over the time, the UIs have been remodeled multiple times. Uh, at the moment, I think we're at the admin UI number version 2, and the account UI version 3 is coming up. So, um, yeah, so that's the way it is. The world keeps changing. And with the latest version of Keycloak 22, you will see that we upgrade to Quarkle 3, to Hibernate 6, Jakarta EE, because, well, inside of Keycloak, it's Java. On the outside, on the web, it's then JavaScript. In the front end, but yeah, if you're writing extensions for, for Keycloak, you um, might be kind of affected by that change that you need to adapt one of the things in, your ex in the extensions that you write. We're supporting things like horizontal port autoscalers, making it a good citizen of Kubernetes. Um, we, had, uh, we passed a complete accessibility check, so we, um, all the admin UIs, for example, are now kind of have a green check mark in our uh, internal check pipeline. So that's a good thing, so that everybody can use Keycloak. And there have been lots of improvements around operator, LDAP, OpenID, Connect Brokerage. And um, yeah, it's lots of small improvements, but um, yeah, you will, yeah, we will see that it just works, hopefully for you. Or maybe a checkbox is added in one of the other places. And then you need to, well, if something is not working, you then find out, um, okay, maybe you want to check this checkbox, yes or no. There's also the Key Clock book, second edition, um, published at the PAC Publishing and written by Stian and Pedro, uh, being the project lead and another project maintainer. And it's based on Key Clock 22 and the Quarkus edition. So if you're new to Key Clock, have a look at the book. And we also have it at the project pavilion um, with the, at the Key Clock stand. So in, if you want to get 20% out of the book, you use this discount code 20 Keycloak. Uh, it's for there for KubeCon attendees. You can use it both on Amazon.com and Pact.com. Right. So there's the project pavilion. We're there in the morning hours. Um, and there's the book. <laughs> there are like flyers, postcards, stickers, uh, the, uh, the usual thing you would expect at the project pavilion. And we are, there are also some other talks on, on the agenda that I want to highlight here. So there's another talk um, from uh, people at Hitachi. Uh, later today, there's the Contrib Fest um, in the afternoon. <coughs> and um, yeah, and tomorrow there will be another uh, Keycloak talk. So lots of things where you can learn new and interesting stuff about Keycloak. So what's then upcoming for Keycloak 23 and beyond? Um, so something that is, has been in the works for quite some time and was a, tech, a preview feature is the declarative uh, user profile support. And it has a strange name, but the cool thing is it enables you a lot of user self-management. Then it, it's all about who can uh, change what, you, uh, well, what are the things that you ask a user when they self-register, the, all the questions, all the attributes that you ask for. Is the user then allowed to change them? Is an admin allowed to change them? Is an admin allowed to see them? So that's a very well cornerstone for user self-management and admin management of, of users uh, in Keycloak. We will hear more, more about uh, Depop and Farfi 2.0 in the next part of the talk. And well, as usual, there are performance improvements, for example, groups and LDAP. So we had a community contributor who did a great job there and improving um, the group support uh, and make it more performant by an order of magnitude. We discontinued Keycloak's map store and we instead chose to evolve the current store. Um, yeah, so if you heard about the map store, it's now, yeah, it's now discontinued, but we will st um, Im improve the current store to uh, take on the challenges that we try to solve with the map store. So having a look at the uh, Keycloak declarative user profile, I prepared a short demo. If I, yes, let's see where the, so the thing is, you can demo declarative user profile. There we go. So you can run Keycloak in the dev mode. So I'm starting Keycloak sh slash dev. And this is then starting Keycloak in a couple of seconds. And I go to the browser and, and log in. I used to have a browser somewhere. Yes, I do.
And if I go to the realm settings here, I don't see declarative user profile because it's a preview feature. And what I then need to do, I need to well, key, kill my key cloak and run it again with the features declarative user profile enabled. And then it starts again. Uh, it will tell me, okay, now it's enabled. Uh, it's starting. And once it started, I can uh, log in again. And I now have a checkbox here saying user profile enabled. I enabled it before, so it's already on. And just to see how powerful user profile is, I have here all the questions I will ask new users uh, when they register. And I can go in here and say who has permission to edit it, to view it, um, what validations, like should there be any prohibited characters. I can add maybe a regular ex ex expression for usernames so people don't choose crazy usernames. So this makes it, that's really a key cornerstone for user self-management. That's currently in Previa, you can try it out and will soon be, um, well, soon whatever that is in open source world, uh, be ready to use in a production environment. Right, so going back to the slides, let's see, that was declarative user profile in a, in a nutshell. We're also doing lots of benchmarks in the Kiklo benchmark project. So you will, if you go there and follow the link at the end, you will see there are, um, we will show you how to calculate memory and CPU requirements. We will have guides to set up uh, Kiklo and across DC setup for active passive. Um, we're hoping to complete this by the end of the year. So how to configure Keycloak with an external InfiniSpan, InfiniSpan in two data centers. So that's what we're currently working on. And we will then soon also have operational procedures for both failover and switchover um, yeah, for everything running in uh, on a Kubernetes environment. The next cool thing is, well, that's currently in the works. It's an open Keycloak OpenID Connect CLI. And I think that's the first time it's gonna be presented anywhere. So uh, premiere for uh, at this conference. So the idea is we see, well, Keycloak is used to be there for users and we've seen people using Keycloak with hundreds of thousands of users, but then it's OpenID Connect also makes its way into, I would say machine to machine interactions and you want to have CLI tools to do OpenID Connect. And we've seen like installations where they have tens of thousands and even more clients in Keycloak. Um, so something that does surprise me at the first sight, but there are lots and lots more clients being um, that you need to manage and do things. And the idea is if you want to test OpenID Connect, then you might want to have a command line tool that you can configure for different providers, flow accounts. Um, you have different flows you want to support. You want to decode a JWT token. I don't know how many times I went to a website and pasted there a JWT token to analyze what's in there. So yeah, for those who like um, command lines, this is the tool for you. But it also integrates with kubectl. Um, it includes a token cache and, you, and if you go to the website, you find out how you can make it work. So your Kubernetes cluster uses Keycloak um, to authenticate access to that cluster. So there's also a short demo I prepared. So, so let's see, demo CLI. So what I do, I start Keycloak again in dev mode. Um, I don't need to start it with any um, profile, nothing at all. And if I then start it, I can run a command called, should be there somewhere. There should be the CLI command. Oh, it's pity it didn't print it out. So I can, yeah, I can configure, this is KCOIDC. I can configure it to set maybe um, which kind of client I wanna impersonate here, <laughs> what kind of client secret there is. And this is like the command line help. I can then configure this client using KC or IDC config set the context, the issuer, the flow I want to use for the, and which client I want to use. I can then say KC or IDC token, which then says, um, yeah, I want to log in. I want to get a token. I then log in here using my test account that I previously created. And then I'm authenticated. 
And then this shows me on my command line the OIDs, um, the, the token that is here. I can then also use the command line to, um, well, this is then saved in, in, a, in a folder .kc if I want to. I can also keep it only in memory. So I can use it in multiple iterations. I can later refresh it. And I can then, um, for example, use the command line tool and say, KC OIDC decode dash dash token equals that token. And it will print it on the command line what's then in this token with all the debug information that I am previously always pasted into a website to figure out what's in the, in the token, which is really, really nice. Yeah, and that's then the command line tool. And if you then continue a little bit deeper in it, you will see how to set up Kubernetes uh, and uh, KC uh, kubectl command on the command line to um, to connect uh, to Keycloak. Sorry, to connect to Keycloak, to connect to Kubernetes, and to make it all work with uh, with uh, checking these tokens that are then passed back and forth. Right. So Keycloak, as I said, is an open source identity and access management solution. We have lots of authentication standard implemented and tested. Um, you can integrate it well into your existing uh, infrastructure. There are service and APIs for managing clients, for users, profiles, everything. You can manage it all using REST interfaces, using a web UI, or using uh, another CLI tool, KC ADM, that I didn't show today. Um, Again, there are, there's a variety of, of sources about where you want to get your data from and store it to. Uh, you can use database, you can use LDAP, you can use uh, custom storages where you want to store your users, credentials, whatever. Um, and with this upcoming user profile thing, it's really, really well prepared for user self-registration, user self-management when it comes to these attributes. And well, there are tokens everywhere. Um, you can use them for applications, you can use it for Kubernetes clusters, you can use them in the browser, you can use them on the command line. And the tool that I showed today, um, it's very in its infancy. Um, you can give it a try and it will, um, it will evolve over time and we will see, I think, more OIDC um, communications on a machine-to-machine -machine level using, um, yeah, and you can test this very, very nicely with this kind of tool. Right. So these are the links uh, about the things that I showed you here. Um, and I'm now handing over to uh, the second speaker. <coughs> so, uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to today have a talk about Keycloak. So in my town, I'd like to emphasize on the supporting API security, open standard, and features on to Keycloak, and also the community activities. Uh, before my talk, let me introduce myself to you briefly. My name is Takashi Norimatsu, a Keycloak maintainer and senior OSS specialist, Kitachi Limited, Japan. I have been contributing many security features on to Keycloak since 2018. For example, W3C web authentication API support, sender console token support, and API security profile support. Uh, to say more precisely, financial grade API security profiles. In my talk, uh, <coughs> in the beginning, I'd like to test you why supporting API security features to Keycloak is important. And next, I'd like to test you how Keycloak supported this API security, open standard, and features. Uh, as you may know, connecting several services in uh, several domains via APIs generate large market in <coughs> digital business sector. For example, the online payment services. But uh, due to their nature, APIs are exposed publicly. Therefore, an attacker can try to access these APIs improperly, illegally. Therefore, 
we need some mechanism to detect and prevent such kind of malicious API access. So securing API access is inevitable to drive digital business sector. I'd like to talk about one of such examples in digital business. Uh, online payment services, sometimes called open banking, that uses API and host to authorization protocol. In this use case, the financial service provider, namely bank, provides their financial services to their end users via APIs. End users use the third party client application. Then, this client application access the API on behalf of the end user to receive financial services from the bank by using OS2 success token. This success token shows that the end user granted this third party application to access the API on behalf of them. This use case requires high security level on accessing the APIs. Therefore, simply applying OS2 authorization protocol is not enough to realize such security level. So what should we do? One of the, the answers is to apply OS2-based security uh, profiles. One of such real example is financial grade API security profile called FAPI security profiles. That were uh, standardized by OpenID Foundation. And this, the FAPI security profiles hardens the OS2 authorization protocol and OIDC authentication protocol. Therefore, uh, FAPI security profiles are more secure compared with simply applying OS2 authorization protocol. Uh, these FAPI security profiles are actually used in the real world. In UK, open banking. In Australia, consumer data rights. In Brazil, open banking and or open finance Brazil. And in Saudi Arabia, SMHSA, open banking. Then, so Keycloak supported these API security profiles. So next, I'd like to tell you how Keycloak supported these API security profiles or API security features. Uh, to say shortly, uh, by community activities and a lot of contributors' contribution. As far as I know, there are uh, two such kind of community activity, FAPSIG and OSIG. OSIG started August uh, 2020 and ended this June. The main objective of this FAPSIG was to support FAPI security profiles and its related security features on the key clock. Then the OSIG that started this July uh, is a successor of FAPSIG. The uh, FAPSIG enlarges the scope of the FAPSIG. The main objective of OSIG is not only supporting FAPI security profiles and its related security features on the key group, but also the other security uh, related specification and features to key group. Uh, both uh, activities the uses the GitHub's the repository and the key group organization. This slide shows the main contribution by FAPI, SIG, and OSIG. Please note that some of them were mainly contributed by FAPI, SIG, and OSIG, but others were mainly contributed as a contributors, and FAPI, SIG, and OSIG helped this contribution to be merged onto key group mainstream, for example, by reviewing their requests. Then, as a result of this activity, 
the key clock got certified the Fabi OpenID provider. And key clock the 1502 uh, got uh, the following four types of the certification. Fabi 1.0, uh, final version part two, and Fabi CBA, Open Bank in Brazil, and Australia CDR. This slide shows the timeline in FAPSIG and OSIG. Please note that it's not an official key clock roadmap. As just mentioned before, the key clock started the August 2020. The main objective is to support FAPI security profiles to say more precisely FAPI 1.0 and FAPI CBA security profiles. And also, FAPC worked for supporting market specific security profiles, Australia, CDR, and Open Banking Brazil. The result of this activity and also the other contributors' contribution, the key growth 15 supported FAPI 1.0 final version, FAPI CBA, Australia CDR, and Open Banking Brazil security profiles. Then the FAPI SIG continued working on the supporting FAPI security profiles, the FAPI 2.0, the next version of FAPI 1.1, and RC 9449, demonstration of proof of possession that is used optionally for realizing FAPI 2.0 security profile. The FAPI SIG also uh, worked for supporting the market specific CTT profiles, uh, UK Open Banking and Open Finance Brazil. The result of this activity and other contributors' contribution, the Key Group 20 supported UK Open Banking and Open Finance Brazil implementers draft version 3 CTT profiles. So, the, therefore, the main objective of FAPC uh, was uh, successfully achieved. So the FAPSIG activity ended and the newly the OSIG activity started. In OSIG, the OSIG still continued working for supporting FAPI 2.7 and DPOP, uh, but also the started the other working items, the pass key and lightweight token, LDSA, OIDC4 IDA, and OID4 BCI. I'd like to test you these newly started working items in more detail later on. As a result of these activities, the key group 23 will support the FAPI 2.0, implementers draft version 2, and DPOP as a technology preview and passkey, also a technology preview, and lightweight token. So I'd like to test you the newly started working items in our SIG. First item is the passkey. Passkey is passwordless authentication that leverages WCC web awesome features that key group already supported. And second working item is Lightweight token. As you may know, the access token of that key clock issues include a lot of information, sometimes called self-contained token or uh, assertion token. So this light, uh, the access token include the unauthenticated user's information sometimes called personal identifiable information. This lightweight token allows Kiko to remove this PII from an access token. Therefore, the client application that receives this access token from the key group cannot know this PII. Third working item is a Edwards Curve Digital Signature with ADDSA. 
The main motivation of supporting this EDDSA is to prepare for preparing for existing algorithm, a sequential algorithm compromise, being compromised in the future. The fourth and fifth working item is about OIDC extension. OpenID Connect for Identity Assurance, OIDC for IDA, and OpenID for Verifiable Credentials Assurance, OID for VCI. Yeah, OID for IDA that allows the key group to add uh, assurance information on an authenticated user to um, ID token and user info response. So therefore, the line party that receive this token and the response can facilitate the verification of an authenticated user and also evaluate how assured the authenticated, authenticated user information is. Then, the OID for BCI. As far as I know, the, in my opinion, OID for BCI is mainly used in decentralized identity system. This OID for BCI allows Keycloak to issue the verifiable credential of the user. That can be verified by verifier in decentralized identity system. Uh, in my opinion, the supporting this OID for VCR is the first step uh, toward the realizing that key clock can be used not only in centralized identity system but also in decentralized identity system. Then the OSIF not only the right calls and sending pre request, reviewing pre request, but also holding the community event called KeyConf. KeyConf 23 uh, was held on this June at London, United Kingdom. The participants uh, discussed their key growth use case and also how to implement their own features on two key group. So we are very happy if you join this key growth community activity. So, we, uh, so, so, so finally, I would like to wrap up my talk. The recent years, the key group community activity, FAPSIG, supported the API security features on the key group, FAPI, mainly FAPI security profiles. And the updated community activity or SIG enhanced the scope of this activity, not only supporting ABI security standard, but also supporting other security features and standards that are mainly related to OSI and OIDC. And we are very welcome and kind of the contribution to Keycloak. That's all for my talk. Thank you very much for your listening. All right, thank you very much. And um, we have now two minutes for questions. <laughs> I know that there is a microphone in the very middle where you can go to announce your question. If you prefer to ask your questions from where you're sitting, I will repeat it afterwards so the people who are watching the recorded talk will also hear it. So what are your questions? There's another level, which is that people's identity actually belongs to them and can move between infrastructure. What, what is this addressing? Okay, I repeat the question. So the question was about how to do decentralized uh, identities uh, with Keycloak and what's the future for that? Ah, so uh, YDC for VCI. So we all, we all see uh, newly uh, currently, uh, newly started these activities. So therefore, uh, in this situation, I've not yet, uh, I've not yet uh, planned which kind of the level the key group 
uh, tried to achieve in DID. So uh, we FAPC group to continue to the working on this activity and uh, maybe in the future find out the which level of the DID can be achieved by key group. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Okay, now a question on the microphone. Sure. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, the key cloak uh, operator, if there have been any uh, improvements there and also the scalability improvements around uh, clustering and caching around that. That was one. And uh, if you can take a second one. Uh, uh, yeah, why don't you go? Okay, the question about um, the operator, um, if it's then also doing the, the optimizations. Yeah, well, eventually it will learn these optimizations. At the moment, you're putting more things into the custom resource for the operator, the way you want to get it optimized. But the operator will learn more things over the next iterations. But for now, you can use the operator, add some bits more to the CR, and then you're good. Okay. Yeah, quick uh, other question was around multi-tenancy. Uh, there are some limitations uh, for more complex uh, scenarios. So, is there any improvements planned? Um, we're working on that, uh, but maybe we take that offline because we are at the end of the time here. Sure. We will stay here in this room and ask more questions, but I would ask uh, the people who have the questions to come to the front of, to us and ask the questions here um, because we are out of time. Thank you very much for listening here. Thank and, you very uh, much.